I'm delighted to be here. It's not the first time. It's a tradition. And uh, as you probably can imagine, many years ago, I was one of your students and uh, hoping to get involved in international affairs and trying to learn from the experience of others. So let me do a little bit of a preparation on that. I will not talk about the issue I am involved in, Western Sahara, for obvious reasons. Okay. No quotes, nothing, because I am in it, and I'm working hard with many others to try to find a formula which can be a positive formula. Um, and I will refrain from going deeply um, or too deeply into the Ukrainian crisis. I know I'm disappointing you. But there again, the UN is, while we're talking, currently heavily involved, many of my colleagues, in trying to find some formulas to attenuate or limit the damage of this conflict. Although I'm familiar with what is happening for obvious reasons. Sure but that doesn't mean I cannot answer your question, of course. In fact, it does help. Let me uh, make one point. Having been myself involved so far in 21 conflicts worldwide in the last 48 years, the first point is sadly, you will discover, um, like I did, that surprisingly, uh, world leaders in international affairs do have something very much in common. They do not have a great capacity of focusing on more than one issue per time. And that is a serious issue, but it is a reality, even superpowers, by the way. Why? Well, because um, that's how their team works, that's how media works, that's how public opinion then works. So the result is we should be worried. We should be worried about those volcanoes, and there are many in the world. One could count, depending on the category of potential heating of the volcano, we could go from 40 to 80 countries, locations, places. Some are very sleepy, but it could explode. Others are ongoing on low intensity. So, what is the next point? Well, the next point is that when the major conflict draws the attention of everyone on that one, then you have, as a result, the fact that uh, there is a tendency of not wanting to get involved in the rest. And there is then a donor fatigue because the money, the attraction goes on the main conflict. Look at what's happening on Ukraine today. Sure. And secondly, there is even an exhaustion of interest by the international community. So what comes next? Mm, a danger. Why? Because why the cloud of the main focus is taking over and taking all the oxygen of the room then that becomes a temptation, an opportunity for other leaders, groups, to be tempted to actually accelerate other conflicts, which have been sleeping for a while, because they're not on the radar screen anymore. That is a major danger. You want an example? Well, at the moment, just to be very far away, and yet potentially dangerous, the Secretary General raised it already several times, is the potential tensions on the borders between Rwanda and Congo at the moment. Far away, nobody noticed it, but it's getting tense. And the potential, just to give you an example very close to my own experience, the northern Syria issue, where there is a strong rumors which then came like a volcano. Volcanoes produce rumors before exploding, where there is rumors about potential military activities, in spite of the fact that we had a period where we were hoping that at least that phase of the conflict would not be taking place. So that leads us to say, well, what can we do then? Since we are aware of the fact that when there is a major issue, especially, by the way, when it's dovetailing with another global issue. And the global issue before was COVID, as you know, and before that, terrorism, and one after the other, and they all suck oxygen, and you don't have the time to recover, and then comes Ukraine. So when all this is happening, what can we do? Well, 
we can do something. And we should always, and by the way, you young people should be always feeling that you can and must do something. And that applies to all of us as well. One is to draw attention, because the problem is lack of light on it. No fari, no radar screen. Keep attention on those conflicts. And, how, and who can do it? Well, since world leaders seem to be too busy, well, it is NGOs, media, ISPI, crisis group, Amnesty International, EU, journalists. So that we at least keep the radar and the light on it, so that there will not be at least the temptation to go far beyond that. And the second one is that uh, there is always something that can be done in order to make those conflicts not exploding. Bottom line, volcanoes, very good example, by the way, can't be predicted. We can guess that they could have, but we will never be able to say when it actually happens. Whereas these political volcanoes are predictable. So the secret there, like in medicine, is prevention. Can be done, should be done, and can be done only when there is some attention on it. The alternative otherwise is that while we are all focusing, for instance, on Ukraine at the moment, we may see many other volcanoes coming up and which will have an epidemical effect. Think about what happened to Syria. It started with nothing or a local revolt and it became a regional and even global. Well, thank you so much for this. But when there are so many volcanoes, there is a risk, of course, that there are earthquakes uh, everywhere. Yes. And this is actually the context, the international context we're living in with uh, you know, confrontation, rivalries, wars taking center stage at the global level. So it's very easy in this situation to lose faith in diplomacy. You have a very long experience yes. as a diplomat, as a peace facilitator. How to restore confidence, faith in, diplo in diplomacy even in a, in a situation like today's situation? First answer is, you're right. It is very tempting to be depressed, pessimistic, cynical about the role of diplomacy when you see so many conflicts and some of them becoming so global in terms of repercussions all over. And secondly, is um, to keep still believing in diplomacy. And I will try to convince you. I know it's not a good timing for convincing anyone about diplomacy, so you have to forgive me, but you know, I chose it as a religion. And uh, basically, I've seen in my own life that every time we were a little bit desperate, and you know, we went through much worse times, I hope, than these ones, frankly, because um, we had a First World War, you were not there, I was not there, but it was a combination of First World War, 20 million people killed, and destruction all over the world, and in Europe in particular, plus Spaniola. Does it ring a bell, COVID? By the way, a little comment on what we were saying before. Um, have you noticed how this uh, capacity of focusing is incredibly radical? and therefore potentially damaging to other volcanoes. The day the conflict in Ukraine started, we didn't hear about COVID anymore. <laughs> Don't you notice it? I even noticed it, but COVID had not just totally disappeared because this monofocal aspect. That's why we needed to help our, uh, the world leaders to have a multifocal lenses. And we can do it together by raising issues like ISP is doing today, Bocconi is doing today in training. So let's go back to the point that you were raising. So there were bad times in the past. Yes, First World War, Second World War, then we had the Cold War. And paradoxically, you know, Cold War, there is some nostalgia for it. <laughs> paradoxically, yeah? but we have to, I remember I was, Part of my career was involved in during the Cold War, and I was a young man, woman like you. We were starting our career, and the Security Council veto, mutual veto, proxy wars, Vietnam, Angola, Cuba crisis. 
and it was totally paralyzed the UN. And the question was, what on earth can the UN do? But there is always an entry point if you really look for it. And in that case, the entry point was, well, true, the Cold War is blocking the Security Council, but there are areas where you can make a difference, where the two major blocks are not involved, NATO and Pacto Varsavia. And at the same time, the good news in the bad news, the bad news is UN Security Council blocked, paralyzed, even more than today. At that time was a constant veto. But the good news is that you had only two players, US, NATO, Pacto Varsavia, Soviet Union. So when they got tired, and they felt that the proxy war was not useful anymore, or they found a way of finding some form of in indirect agreement, they were able to tell both sides, stop it there, don't move. That is not happening today. I agree. That's why we should be concerned about it. But even then, we had an entry point. And the entry point was the international operational humanitarian diplomacy. In other words, you don't want to get a deal on peace. You don't want to talk about peace. You are still in the Cold War. But what about the hunger in Ethiopia? What about vaccinations in Central America? What about the possibility of having a lifeline in Sudan? How to find a other way to make sure that we can be operational and remember one thing, the global world and politics will continue having their own stalemates. But for us, for you, the priority is we the people. Can we make a difference in the meanwhile? And now I'll give you an example. And that gets into Ukraine for a moment, but I will stop there, no more than that. <laughs> when I think the Secretary General realized that in fact there was no movement on the Security Council, he went to Moscow and to Kiev, as you know. And uh, I was not there, so I can't tell you what happened, and I would not go into details. But what came out afterwards was that he actually decided to follow exactly what I'm referring to, which we had during the Cold War, the humanitarian operational diplomacy, an entry point. And through that, hopefully create goodwill, or at least make a difference for some people, Mariupol. The evacuation of Mariupol, first the civilians, then the others. But it was not perfect because, as you know, in these deals, nothing is totally perfect. But it did make a difference, particularly for the humanitarian side of the civilians. And now, while we are talking, that's why I stopped talking about it, is this attempt, which I think is totally legitimate and desperately needed, and which I know Italy with President Draghi is pushing for as well, is uh, the possibility of unblocking grain and fertilizers from Ukraine, from Russia, so that at least while the war goes on, and it is terrible, not millions and millions of people who have nothing to do with this conflict will be suffering from. So bottom line, yes, diplomacy is at the moment in a difficult moment. But is this a reason to give up on it? At the end of the day, we will always go back to it in one form or the other. And while we're waiting, we can still make a difference. Thank you very much for giving us hope, at least. And uh, you were referring to the youth. And uh, we as ISPIN Bocconi, we run a program parallel to this event, which is the G20 Global Ambassadors. So if it's fine with you, I would take a question from a, a young participant. So Absolutely. I may, uh, should be a young student here in the first row. Please stand up, introduce yourself. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Abdullah. I'm one of the uh, uh, G20 Simulation Game Ambassadors. And I would like to thank you for your time and for the opportunity uh, given me to ask you a question. Mm. We live actually in a deeply uh, uncertain time and the global youth has been struck by the pandemic, wars and of course climate change. And, but at the same time you will find us 
I'm included, at the front line of uh, proposals, so solutions to these um, challenges. What's your advice to us youngsters, to us students and youth from the world? I have to breathe a little bit and think because uh, you are smart and uh, uh, I'm getting prepared for the future life and uh, I should not just give you generic good news. So um, let's start by saying Ed, um, you're right in raising this question because if I were you, I would be concerned and I would be looking for answers on how we can really, as a young people, believe that we can make a difference by preparing ourselves. Um, there was, as I said before, plenty of occasions where younger people than you, or even myself at your age, did feel a feeling of despair or concern. But then we did see that we could make a difference in the way I just told you. And you know how? Also by doing prevention rather than curing. Um, many of some of you know that I, when I, I was, you know, inspired by an incident that took place when I was just 18, which was in Cyprus, when I saw by a company called Apprendista, a delegation of the World Food Program to Cyprus, and I saw a young man, a young boy, being shot by a sniper. And that produced a level of outrage that has kept me going, including now. I'm not supposed to, at my age, to continue working very hard in the field. But in fact, that outrage goes far beyond career. It is a way of believing that you can and should try, if you can, make a difference. Now, therefore, I say the first message to you is please, please, please don't despair. Don't feel cynical about it or skeptical because the alternative is the jungle. And uh, history has proven this type of cycle, down, down, and then up. Secondly, is that you can make a difference, especially in the prevention. And the prevention is uh, by helping in one way or the other to avoid something to happen. Those, I, I'm very proud, for instance, of a conflict that no one heard of. Why? Because it never took place. And it didn't take place, it's not on the news. You may find it on Google if you look the Mistura Nepal 2014, 2004. Because uh, it, uh, it was a, a conflict which had started between the guerrilla Maoist and the government, and then had 20,000 people killed. And both sides stopped for a while, but it was going to start again. And we were able, by using one element that I advise you to do, studying some elements of psychology, not just geopolitics. Because the, the people who are running the world and are taking decisions are not purely ideological. Think about it, look around, look at them. There is a need to analyze the psychological reason why that person, that man, that woman, they're mostly men at the moment, who have been taking that type of decision. Then you cover it up, of course, with geopolitics, nationalistic, even religious reasons. History has been like that, but particularly recently. So try to have a little course on psychology, and in fact, I would advise Bocconi, if they, perhaps they already have it, to have a sort of psychology in geopolitics, because it will help you to understand and put yourself on the other side of the ground. And that will help us and help you to first understand why they're doing it, and secondly, how you can make a difference from that. Now, let me make a little uh, appeal here. So, since you are students still, let me quote the Secretary General, and I will read it this time because uh, I don't remember it by heart. He, had, uh, he actually was present a few months as I go to an opening opportunity in the US to a university. And he referred, and I liked it very much, 
to the talents, i talenti, which by the way was a Roman moneta, not by accident, <laughs> because uh, probably it was referred to the capacity of human beings to be good soldiers, good scientists, and so on, i talenti. And what about la parabola dei talenti, the parable of talenti? Two, it is in other words, each of us, each of you, have been given by God, by your country, by your family, by your own capacities, the capacity and the potential of contributing to what, in fact, can be a better world, and give it back. That element, I think, is very important. To me, has been essential, has been the energy behind wanting to believe that you can make a difference and giving it back. So his message was to the students, and I'm trying to tell it to you, be useful, mindful, kind, bold, which doesn't mean arrogant, bold, kind, yes, but not weak, principled, follow those principles, don't give up on them. It will always be a temptation to make a compromise, be generous with your talents. In other words, share them, use them. Put them at the service not only of your own income, but also very much for others. And B, what business knows is always crucial, but diplomacy is normally in the old way not necessarily a quality. I believe it is a quality, it's a must. Be creative and be ready to jump on opportunities, which is a combination of creativity. And the alternative is the law of jungle, and you know it. So the real issue is believing that uh, you should try to dare to make a difference, which also means the capacity of failing. Therefore, my motto with you is, did you try? Mm -hmm. Did you fail? Mm -hmm. Try better and fail better, but don't give up. And use the privilege that you all have, because you have a privilege, like I had, like you had, to be in this country, to be in this university, to be interested in being equipped to make a difference, to actually do so. Ambassador, thank you very much. I promise yeah. I will attend a course of psychology, but I'm pretty sure I will not be as successful as you, <laughs> as peace facilitator. No, no, no. Thank you very much.